Welcome back, everybody, to the Bear Trap Discord podcast. All charts, as always, um, are courtesy of Authocracy. Uh, I'm John Kirby. My co-host is Vic, uh, one of the founders of the Bear Trap Discord podcast. This is our uh, fourth episode, which is actually our fifth episode because we had uh, one episode with two parts, and we have a lot more material in the works. Um, this time, it's sort of an hour and 20 minutes of us going through all the charts that we think are relevant right now. Well, maybe not all, but um, a lot of them. And um, we're talking about how we're going to get this supposed Santa Claus end of year rally, uh, among other things. I've divided this video up into sections, so hopefully that's useful to people. Um, what else do I want to add? Yeah, please uh, share it. Uh, we want as many people to get this as possible. Uh, rate it, subscribe, whatever. You guys know what to do. Um, and send us feedback. We're always looking for uh, more ideas for more uh, of these podcasts, and we just love to talk about the markets, as you guys can probably tell. All right. Uh, enjoy, guys. So, uh, yeah, we're back once again. Let's uh, let's get rolling. Um, what are we going to talk about today? I don't even. We don't even know. I think we're just going to go over some basics here right yeah i think i think last week was busy enough that we both ended up kind of like damn done with the markets for a little bit for maybe real, over the weekend real. taking a break yep yep um hopefully or, everybody did the same thing too man because taking a break is so such a big deal yeah it's, and it's, it's hard it's hard sometimes especially when you have stuff that's this exciting to be honest um yeah yeah, it is. And I saw on Twitter the other day, uh, was today, actually, he was uh, some guy was like, dang it, I took two days off. And those are the two biggest days of the year, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's just how it works sometimes, man. Like, I used to be in this chat, this guy, would, he would go on vacation in the market with Crater, and he was the biggest bear. And he was just always at the beach and the markets just like diving. And it was like, so we were always just like, just tell us when you're going out of town, man, we'll just load puts for you. <laughs> <laughs> It's just how it's crazy how the market works. But, yeah, you should always take a break, I think, and uh, come back a little refreshed. It helps a lot. Maybe maybe not on a CPI day. Maybe don't take that break on CPI day. Right, right. Well, you know, if you know CPI is coming or you know a big day is coming, you know, you just take a couple of days before that. You know, nothing's going to happen. Most of the time you burn yourself out watching the chop. You know what I mean? And uh, I know I do. Like, I get sick of the market after a few days of just it chopping around. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden it does something. And um, yeah, and I'm burned out, and I don't play it right or whatever. And that's no, how the market exactly. gets you, man. That's how it gets you. But what are we thinking this week? I mean, I don't know if you got any kind of like theories coming into this week, given the the rally that we had. I mean, we 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 basically had a Santa Claus rally. The the biggest Santa Claus rally that ever happened was like nine point six percent in about five days. Five days. And that was at the end of the year. So uh, we just had a 9% rally, I believe, in uh, two days. And uh, so I, I put out a tweet. I was just like, dude, that was the Santa Claus rally right there. Everybody was already, <laughs> they're already pricing it in, aren't they? What do you we think got about it. that? Um, yeah, I think, I think, I mean, with the, usually with these things, I look at the VIX, right? And I'll, I'll just pull it up. And, and I'm just thinking, oops, VIX, VIX. I, I'm just thinking, okay. You know how much lower can we go on here before people start buying up that wall um and and that was one of the main things that i was thinking about because i remember you texted me you were like hey you know i want to talk about this rally into the end of the year and my two thoughts were well first of all i hope we don't do that because i sold calls against all those puts short puts i had <laughs> and, and the mm -hmm. second thought i had was um all right so we're looking for a 24 vix again something like that mm -hmm. um and that, it could happen, you know. I just hope we chop around a little bit before it happens. Um, I was talking to Ock about uh, – I, I wish you had this chart. I wish I could send this uh, – maybe I can here. I'm going to send this over to you because uh, it's really fascinating. And I wanted Ock's opinion on it, and he was just basically like, you know, uh, you're going to see a mean reversion on something like this. I'm going to send this in the chat. See if you can pull this up. Um, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's the fact that realized ball – I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but uh, we can't open the chart. Oh, right. no. Sorry about that. Okay. Don't worry. No worries. Anyways. Send me, uh, take a screenshot. Send me a screenshot. I will. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Good idea. Um, what happens is uh, you got you got realized vol. I, like, I watch this every day, and I don't see this, this particular setup very often. And I went back and kind of looked and saw what happened, and it does – 
sort of lean towards, you know, you're just going to see this incredible vol crush into the This is just my, my initial thinking on it. And um, I don't know if you can, you can pull that puppy up, but. Yeah, it's 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 up right now. Um, yeah. So all right. So you got you got the different term structure here with the VIXs, and then you got the put call ratio down there. Uh, I think that's for NYSE uh, at the bottom. Um, but then uh, the white line is is realized vol. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's our vol? And we can see that our vol is actually way up, obviously, because we had this giant ass rally just now, right? And then and uh -huh. then obviously implied vols came down. Because so you see the structure. Up. The structure is basically normalized here with the, the nine day below the 30 day VIX. Everything's below the three month, six month, one year. But then you got our vol above everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, you got a couple days coming up until VIX X. OK, so uh, here's where this cycle comes in. And I, I talk about this a lot where we're, we're just trying to play this little, you know, Vanna charm cycle right in between OPEX and VIX X and FOMCs and that kind of stuff. So I was just like, I've never seen this into into the uh, into the the expirations, where our ball is like this. Um, uh, yeah, I also I also want to point out I think that behind here this is the spy or SPX, right? Yeah, it's that's like, spy. I, I put spy yeah, on there. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay. So and then are we talking for VIXX? Are we talking the that's purple VIXX line or the orange? Right there. No purple. Orange purple. is going to okay. be OPEX. Yep. That makes perfect sense. Okay, because it's the one. Look at the put the... call ratio. I got I got to I got to just highlight that because that put call ratio down there has not been this low. Uh, for a very long time. And I'm going to tell you, um, last time I saw it this low uh, was January January this year. Um, yeah, January this year. So January this year, <laughs> we were trading on SPY. We were up in the 440s, 450s uh, last time it was really this low. So just for context, uh, where the put call ratio is, is, is – you know, it's like at a, a 10 month low right now from what I yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, you can't even see it on this chart where it was, uh, yeah. Yeah, so if I go back, if, if I send you the screenshot to go back, it's like literally January of this year is, is the last time it ticked to that level. And uh, so that was interesting too. So we got our vol, which is spiked. We got the VIX term structure, which is normalized finally. We got the nine day cross below the VIX, which it took two days essentially uh, of the Santa Claus rally. <laughs> And which was basically just a huge squeeze uh, to get that to to cross below the, the VIX 30. So um, it's really interesting what's happening here. So Auk, um, he was basically like, just look for that that to revert, uh, that R ball to come down. And yeah. if that happens, I mean, I don't know what the implications are, but me personally, I think if that R ball is, is going to slide down into the end of the year, then we're we're ripping, dude. 420 might not even be the stop. So. That's what I think. I don't know. Sorry, are you saying that you're you're saying the article like the white line has to revert to where? Well, I mean, uh, revert back to like maybe like 20, uh, 18, something like that. Oh, okay, where it was around here. I got you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you you kind of look at it like, man, that that is, uh, you know, and every time if we if I went back on this chart, you look back at the different situ times where it's where it's high, you know, where it's hitting like 30. Um, it might sit there at 30 for a bit, but it always tends to just come, want to come back down to that 18, 20 uh, range first. Okay, just because I want to understand your thinking a little better. Um, to me, if Argyle is going to come back down to 20 or something, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're rallying up. It just means because we could just chop, right? It could just mean that, you know, the market, we found a price yes. that we like. This is a good yeah. level. And then every day, instead of seeing, you know, 1%, 1.5% moves, 5% moves, hey, CPI. Um, we'll be looking at, you know, 0.3% moves, 0.5% moves every day. It, it's, it's possible that we get like, um, we get like a melt up where it's just nothing every day. It's just dead. It's mm -hmm. sort of what I would, I, I'm preparing my, myself for the possibility of this. Cause I hate this. I hate that type of market. Like I hate that summer market where, you know, ES is only up like five points. And it just will not move, dude, like the entire day. Like a big day for it is like 10 points, you know. And it, it's – I'm preparing myself for that situation for like the next so month what and is, a half or so. Why would a volatility why, – why would a realized vol that's that low mean that we have to be going up? A realized vol is high right now. Yeah. And uh, an implied vol is low, which in my opinion means that, means that you should be hedging personally. But um, – 
because it's like the same it's the same kind of thing where you know you get historical volatility if it's pull up um can you pull up a skew chart i think i have one and i'm uh, going to try and explain my thought process and you tell me if it's off but um i'm going to see i had i had one pulled up here recently let me pull it up here and i'll send it to you but yeah it's it's this idea where uh, if historical vol is printing higher than implied vol here we go i found it let me send this over to you but then doesn't that suggest uh, the market is in, in an extreme complacent phase? So look at, so those yellow lines there in the middle between like 30 and 40 or whatever, that's going to be the historical vol. Mm -hmm. And then you got the implied vol for the 30, 60, 90. You got the, you know, the one year high for the IV 30, one year low for that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're now at a point where like, all the actual pricing of the vol, right? Like our IV is lower than our HV, which is very unique. Uh, it, sorry, that's, I shouldn't qualify unique. It's unique. No, no, no. You're right. It is unique for, for where we're at. I mean, being that we're in a bear market, uh, people are kind of complacent. And then when I listen to Jam say, you know, skew is at the like the zero percentile, meaning, you know, people are just not pricing in the head, the tails, essentially, um, uh, of the market right now. And that makes sense to me here because it's just like, well, I mean, the, the implied vol, which is, you know, basically our expectation of, you know, moves going out 30, 60, 90 days is way below the, the historical moves is the actual. So people are essentially underestimating the possibility of big moves happening. And I think that's why it keeps happening when we get a moves like what we've seen. But it's like if. We're in a situation like that. I'm preparing myself for continued complacency because that complacency can last for a lot longer than people think. But what, what I don't understand yet is what is the mechanism whereby that complacency generates movement to the upside as opposed I would to simply chop? Per, well, I think it's that the, the idea of the melt-up, in my opinion, is, is the fact that... Um, this R vol, this basically the historical volatility is going to revert to the mean, to the implied volatility instead of the other way around. That's what I'm thinking is potentially going to happen. But and the thing is that like historical volatility is a metric only of price movement. It's not a metric of the like movement in implies, right? Sure, so but like so which leads which, right? So, I mean, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to. Um, well, implied, implied should lead. Implied should lead. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So implied should lead. So if implied is leading here, even the one year is below it, then historical vol is probably going to come down first before we see any kind of big cratering. And if you look back on that chart that I sent you with that, uh, with that volatility structure, uh, go back to really in that same exact chart, you can look back to where our vol was 18, 18 or 19 or 20, and you can see where that peak happened. What was everything? What was what was happening? You saw the one year flatten out. You saw the six month flatten out. The three month flatten out. And then essentially, once that once we kind of got a, a tick up in those nine days, mm. that's, that started leading. You know, there's that peak again, uh, right? When everybody is like max complacency. And so, based on what Ock was saying, based on what Jam is saying, based on what you know, just the basic logic of I think how it works, um, you're gonna see that. Our vol come back down again. I don't know if it comes back to 18 or 20 or whatever, but you're going to see that kind of come back down, kind of match up with that IV. And uh, I think you probably, that's where you get your rally, like a blow yeah. up. So, okay. So here's, here's the reason I was having a little trouble processing this thought, but I think I understand what you're saying. So um, for me, our vol and like I vol are different because implied volatility is skewed to the put side um right usually whereas usually usually whereas whereas realized vol is not in other words no. realized vol it can be volatility to the upside or volatility to the downside right but but i implied volatility has a tendency to be volatility to the downside um so the reason i was asking i'm like well okay if our vol is going to come back down to 20 or whatever um, that shouldn't necessarily mean that we go up, but the problem is, and, and I think this is what you're pointing to, it leads to this sort of feedback cycle in implies, um, which ends up creating this melt up as well. Is that right? Correct. And I, you, you're right. You might see this chop for a bit. 
um, maybe maybe this maybe this move up doesn't start till after OPEX, you know, after all these structural flows are kind of over with again. Uh, but maybe maybe it happens beginning of the month December, that kind of thing. Maybe we got to wait till the end of the month. I don't know. Um, but what I'm saying is, yeah, just exactly that is is, uh, and we always talk about this feed feedback loop of the of the flows, right? It's you know, it's it basically kind of it's, feeds on itself. It's, it's basically if. I actually, I think I, I can put, formulate it uh, precisely. Um, if realized volatility is going down, it means that people aren't making money on their options, um, or they're making less and less money on their options, meaning that people want to have fewer options. As people have fewer options, um, they're bailing out on them. And it just so happens to be the case that people typically like to have more puts than calls. So as people are bailing out of options, they're gonna be bailing out of more puts than calls proportionally, which is actually going to drive price up, and that leads to your, you know, at, at being implied vol being left skewed, essentially. Um, yeah, that makes sense. What you're saying, okay. people are gonna are, are gonna tend to want to be in puts more than calls because they're more likely to sell the calls because why they own the shares or their long futures, and uh, and that's just kind of the that's just kind of the mechanism that it's been for forever. You have this, you have this, you have this like giant momentum that's built up in the system just as a nat on a natural basis just because of that and so if you give it any kind of like any kind of advantage any kind of edge kind of like what we're seeing here then that's where you get those feedback loops and uh, you probably see another peak peak like what we just saw here uh you know back in august where you know the market rips up again um you're you're looking at that channel pull up your chart there with your channel yeah, let me see if that I can you wanted to that. talk about on just the basic uh, technicals. Yeah, or you, you the... were kind of thinking that things could pop, possibly top out at. Aha, uh -huh. here we go. My major channel. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, let me get on to a daily, actually. That'll be a little easier for us. Okay, so, yeah, we don't really need the volume profile here, but... I oh, know, um, leave it, leave it. It's fine, it's fine. Um so okay. we're we're sitting here on a linear regression of how many how long how how what's the period of this linear? Is this uh, a hundred yeah, hundred day? This this is a ten period linear regression, but I have yeah. many of them. So I have um, I usually look at this on a weekly. So I think I'll actually pull that back up because it makes more sense on a weekly. Um, so I do a ten period on a ten uh, on a weekly, and then um, this is uh, going to be whatever one one standard deviation this is probably 1.5 and this is two gotcha okay all right uh, so uh as far as far as like if you're if you're a super mega bear here you know if you look back i mean even if you just scroll back towards that covid low there um you can see we're we're basically trading at covid lows uh just in an uptrend right yeah, yeah, we, we, we didn't really touch it. I'm sorry, I need to correct myself. Um, I looked, this is actually the 1.5 standard deviation. Okay. This is the two and this is the three. Which makes okay, cool. Sense. So yeah, so we, we tapped the 1.5 and- And, and if, if you look at the volume profile, look at this beautiful little spot at around 350 for us to touch. Yeah, yeah, um, we could touch it. It is, it's pot, we, on SPY, didn't we hit 348 or something like that? Yeah, we did. We did. We came. We actually came and hit it, and uh, that's that little pocket right there. Yep. Right. Okay. So we actually came down into the 1.5. Uh, it seems like here. Um, I'm not sure why it doesn't show it on the chart there. Why does it only go down to? What am I missing here? I think it's because we came up so quickly in that week. Um, that is kind of insane, though. I was also wondering about that. I'm like, what the hell is this? Um, why does it I think, have I don't, going I don't think you have I don't think you have all the data here, my man. Um, <laughs> that is accurate. This is a chart. This isn't a historical chart. Uh, is that is because like, you're uh, you're on real time data here? Okay. No, I'm not. Um, sometimes I go back. This is the on demand. Here we go. This is your full chart. There we go. <laughs> all right, now go back <laughs> to that week. Go back. You're good. Go back to that weekly chart there. Okay. Um, weekly. Yep. Aha! That makes okay. more sense. Perfect. <laughs> all right, so. Uh, we, we are in like this weird, like megaphone pattern, you know, coming down this slow grind. Uh, I, I, I think you are, are hoping maybe one more, one more dip maybe before we, uh, before we try to go for higher. I'm not sure. What, is that what you're kind of, um, you're kind of thinking maybe or no? 
Well, I'm just looking here and kind of naively, right? We had that uh, high 470, 470 uh, 480 basically, and then tap, tap, tap. Uh, if we were to just extend that line over, it looks like it should be around here, maybe 420. So it seems like we got to come up and touch 420 and then turn back down. And what's interesting about that 420 number is that I think that there's a gap there. Uh, there's a gap around 409, 410, and there's a gap around 420. So that makes a lot of sense, given that the fact that the market loves filling in, at least SPY loves filling upside gaps. Um, yeah, they love it. So, you know, just naturally, I think they're going to try and fuel it to, to go fill those gaps up there. Um, and that line's right up perfect with that line. Uh, it almost seems too easy, but, um, yeah, that, that makes sense. So given this feedback loop we just talked about with, with the volatility structure uh, and the way that is set up and the fact that we've got gaps leading up into this upper trend line. Uh, into, you know, a bullish seasonality, you know, I'm seeing a lot of evidence here that's, and, and given the fact that this, uh, this IV is extremely low and probably going to go lower and, uh, you know, yeah, but, but short, also, also volume and IV are down here, right? I have both of them on the sub chart and, um, this is still, we're pretty high in IV terms right now. Um, so we okay. could, we could definitely come all the way back down to like around yeah. whatever. Uh, yeah, and that's here. the thing about I think with IV, a lot of folks, and I see this on Twitter too, and I used to be this way, is like you've seen it come down from like 34, 33. It's basically come all the way down to like 23 handle. And it, it's almost been a straight shot down for the most part. There was like a couple blips there where it tried to spike up, but it's like the thing about that IV, pull up the VIX gex because it's like this is the feedback loop that happens in IV. Uh, yeah. VIX is man once you get the momentum going on the downside on the vix it's really hard to turn the ship there a hundred percent and like they're just pressing because because here's the thing like this is a trade that is um it's like a trade of nature right volatility needs to re revert to the mean and everybody at all these big funds knows it and so they love professional traders love these short vix trades they love buying the VIX puts. They love buying the UVIX C puts because it's 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 the thing that you know all of retail doesn't do, and they just make you know consistent income just doing that. Um, and that's another thing I was I was kind of alluding to the fact that the market, the structure, underlying structure of the market is a carry trade. It's always kind of like trying to tend towards this carry trade where, uh, you know. You could just get into a, a trade and it's just going to make you money just by being in it. And this short vol trade has always sort of been that carry trade for yeah. decades, right? And uh, and so you always kind of have that, like the, now, those traders that were doing it back then, they're always trying to come back to that easy trade, I think. And, and then whenever you get this situation like this, what is going to possibly take us down? There's something out there that's going to take us down. I'm pretty sure. I don't know what it is yet, but I know what is going to happen. But as far as I can tell right now, there's nothing, right? What's yeah. in the news? What's in the news that can possibly, you know, create a situation where the VIX is going to spike well, to 40? When it's already had so many chances. Let me let me add another couple of things before we get to that. Um, so if I'm looking at this and I see right this line right here, and this is the 2022 end of the year, um, and then each of these bars is a week, so we got you know this is kind of stupid thinking, but like okay one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, whatever, something like that, right? Um, and then in that time, it seems like we have to come up to 420. If we get a lot, if we get beyond 420, it would seem like this thing's gonna squeeze up a lot just because that channel is so, so prevalent. So one of the things I, was, I wanted to say is that we kind of have to think about timing a little bit, you know? So that we need to, um, I, I really do think that we need to chop a little bit at least before we start to head up there. Like we can't just continue to squeeze. We need to see bears come back in for a little bit, chop a little bit so that then we can get up there by the end of the year. Um, so I, I agree, but I also think that we need to take our time. All right, I'm back. Okay, yeah, no, you're right. I, I agree with that too. And, and, and given the, the scenario I, I've been trying to lay out here, just in, for my initial thesis here, uh, I'm trying to disprove this thing. I don't want it to be true because I hate this type of market. But if it is true, I'm just going to have to roll with it uh, and just be selling puts every day. But, um, you know, I, I think if the melt up theory comes true, it would be a choppy scenario. It would be like um, it'd be very, very painful to be a bear because uh, you would you wouldn't have these huge bullish moves. 
Um, you would have just like these a uh, lot of V shapes, you know, where you get the you get the volatility sweep that happens, sort of like what happened on uh, on Friday, where you get a, a lot of spike downs and then everything gets bought up again. It's uh, also, I think, also melt up might might be overstating it because it's only another five percent to four twenty, and we just did what did we do nine percent, ten percent the last two days. Sure. No, um, and I, I agree. And so it, that's why I say your choppy kind of idea where, you know, it's going to take a little bit. That makes really good sense, given that it's not much higher to go until I, you know, we start hitting those, you know, those those, mo those higher time frame resistances, uh, especially, into, yeah. especially into this, um, this idea that this first quarter is going to be, you know, something's about the about the break, it basically is what I think. I think this whole crypto thing too. We might even touch on some of that. I think it's just, you know, it's it's all just a symptom of what's really happening. You know what I mean? Well, so, well, it's the fact it's the fact that you know liquidity is being drained from the marketplace, and and I think I think something that uh, people are, it's it's very easy to forget that what's what's happening here is risk is actually increasing, um, because the less money there is in the system, the more vulnerable parts of the financial system are. And it's not as if just because we had a rally, um, all of a sudden there's more money in the financial system. No, what the Fed's doing is consistent. Um, and, uh, you know, the people thought, I mean, this is actually a really, a really good case, right? Uh, the FTX that you bring up, right? Um, people thought FTX was solid. And, and the reason being that FTX had survived all of these other, uh, all these other issues they were bailing out, were they, they bailing out BlockFi? I think they were going to bail out Voyager as well. Um, and uh, now all of a sudden we see that, you know, they had they had a substantial vulnerability and there may have been some stuff going on in the crypto system, right? Like, I think I think Binance was opportunistic personally, and I think that they did something that, um, you know, in the in the normal financial world is frowned upon, would be frowned upon by regulators, but they saw an opportunity and they took it. And um, but it doesn't matter. The point was. FTX was vulnerable to it, right? Um, and it's their equity that was vulnerable. Because if you think about it, right, like the their coin, whatever it's called, like FTT or something, right? Um, the fact that they were so heavily invested in essentially their own equity is what made them susceptible to this type of vulnerability. And this is the same sort of thing that you know can happen with you know massive amounts of share buybacks. We used to we saw it back in the day with Enron, right? And this was I think like double the size of Enron. Um, so uh, this just goes to say like. Liquidity is consistently draining from the marketplace. We see people or institutions that seem to be solid. We see the market being solid and we think, oh, we're still okay. But the reality is that we're not going to see those vulnerabilities until they really happen. Have you um, ever seen, have you ever watched uh, The Big Short? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. So, you know, when, you know, when they're, uh, he's trying to get his marks for his credit default swaps and he's just like, I don't understand, you know, they're linked to these you know, these mortgage backed securities that are, you know, basically defaulting, how can they not be going up in price? Right. Mm -hmm. And it was like, they were controlling, you know, since it was just a, you know, an off market, they were controlling the markups and they were keeping them low until they could secure themselves a short position on it. I think that kind of stuff is happening right now. Personally, I think you're going to have these, these rallies here are, are, are cover for, uh, for the big players. Yeah, to be able to to be able to get out. It's like, do you see any insider buying anywhere? I mean, I don't no. know. I'll be no, looking I, at I, insider buying, and I'm just like, I don't see anybody even trying to buy back their own stock. Like, what, like nothing's happening. Nobody wants the stock, but yeah, it's going up. I don't, I don't have an indicator for this, but you know how intraday we have volume average weighted price, which mm -hmm. is such a useful metric because not all moves are created equal, right? Sometimes you'll have a price that'll go up, but like there's not as much volume behind it. So why should I really trust that that move, right? Um, but those are structural I mean, flows, right? Those are the, uh, you know, those are the passive index funds, you know, buying the stock just because it's just on, on automatic pilot. Yeah. And it's just I short wish, covering. I wish we had VWAP for like everything, right? And, and we do, cause we can look at inflows and outflows and all that sort of thing. But I wish we just could look at this chart of spy and then have a giant VWAP that says to us, yeah, okay, we're going up, but the VWAP isn't moving up with the price. Um, you know yeah. what I mean? Yep. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to send you another screenshot here and, uh, I'm going to just show you some of these, some of these insider, <laughs> some of the insider buying and selling that's happening. And it's, it's not, I mean, you don't see a lot now. This might be interesting for people, but, um, you know, 
here's here's the top that I I'm I'm just pulling this real quick off of like five thousand stocks, but this is like the top insider buying in the last month. Let me send this over uh, to you here. I, I love this. I asked for a chart and Vic's like, yeah, just give me a second here real quick. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> so here you go. Let, let's just see if it if it uh, if this means anything. But this is just like the top, you know, six that I could that I could find. Um, oh yeah, this is this is bullshit. <laughs> and so you can see, you know, the top one, Biohaven. Uh, and then what's interesting is this IPO is getting bought. I'm really interested in buying this mobile eye, but um, I'm, I'm waiting a little bit longer. But, you know, 54 million in insider buying in the last month. I mean, I don't feel like that's not very much. Um, no. and, and that's the most out of 5,000 stocks in the last month. Uh, let me do let me do the sells here. Let me see. I don't know what the sells look like here. Could we could we also look <laughs> All at right, here, one of let, those... me show you the, let me show you the sells real quick. OK. okay. What was your question? Oh, I wanted to get that the that dark dark pool index thing that we have as well. Oh yeah, yeah, that one's good too. Uh, but there's there's the sells. Oh, you can see the difference between the buys and sells on the top side of the market and the bottom side. Um, I mean, it's 10x. Yeah. It's not 10X. only not not only is it 10x, it's interesting that um. Well, you know, I don't want to speculate too much because this is a, such a small uh, data sample. But that's it is, the point. It's it 10X. is. It, the, it was. I'm just trying to lead to my point. I look at this like almost every day, where I'm looking at these insider buys and sells. I don't see any man. Like I don't see people, you know, investing in their own stock. And you see something like Elon, you know, lying to people uh, about not selling Tesla anymore, and then he, he comes out that he sold four billion dollars worth. Dude, that he he's driving me insane. Like I every time I oh, think yeah. he can't he can't get more insane, he just does. And so um, you got you got such that kind of stuff though, and, and what I've learned, and this might be off topic, I don't know, but that kind of stuff happens at the tops of markets because the market gets so filled with fluff and it gets just so frothy with money, and it's like Tesla wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for zero percent interest rates. Correct, think about yeah. that. So you know, no wonder Zuckerberg was selling every day during 2021. No wonder Bezos was selling every day, and then he he gets out. No wonder Elon Musk is lying and trying to sell for taxes or trying to sell. Well, and, and, and what's what's infuriating to me is that then Zuck will come out and say something like, oh, sorry, we overhired because we, you know, we're over eager to expand during this period. And I understand, like, let's say that you're a small, you know, startup tech company and you're trying to make it. It's like, yeah, you have to make wagers on the future and be optimistic. But if you're a big company like Meta and you have all this information about the economy just because of your internal metrics, you should be able to know and understand what's coming to the point where you're not over hiring in a period in which you shouldn't be. Um, yeah, no, for sure. And, and, and again, that, that's another thing is that that right there is just another symptom of just people having too much money. They don't know what to do with it. You know, let's just hire a bunch of let's just go and try to create the metaverse. You know, they don't have they don't know what else to do with the money. And this yeah. is the idea that Jim always talks about, where he's like, well, the Fed has basically been creating this money. We didn't get inflation because all this liquidity was going to planet Palo Alto, where it was going somewhere else. It wasn't going to Earth. It wasn't going to people's pockets. It was going to these corporations for them to just basically be a giant R&D center and just do stuff with it, you know? Well, and, and, and the issue, Ireland too, is it's, it's not the right things. sector, dude. It's not the right – like, we don't need more – I mean – this is, you know, this is a little opinionated, but we don't necessarily need more digital innovation and more metaverse right now. Like we need, you know, healthcare investment, honestly. Yeah. Um, no, so you're right. We, you're right. The money is mis misallocated because of this, right? So. And I mean, this is this is classical sort of, uh, you know, economic talk. That the the knowing that having easy money leads to inefficiencies in terms of or or what's called malinvestment, right? And this is just a classic case of that. Um, and this has been 40 years of it. So the 40 years of, of this malinvestment, this, uh, these low interest rates, uh, everything, that's all coming to an end. But it doesn't happen overnight. You know? Exactly. First, exactly. You see the, first, you start seeing the signs. You start seeing all the insiders getting out. You start seeing you know, Elon doing weird stuff, buying Twitter instead of putting all his, keeping all his money in Tesla. Um, you know? And you start, seeing, uh, you start seeing stuff like crypto crater. Um, you know, crypto went went nuts. Why did it go nuts? Well, the the Fed came out and did you know zero percent interest rate, emergency rate cut to zero. And you know what, dude, you could go out and get and, and buy all the crypto you wanted. Just mortgage your house, go out and get a bunch of credit cards, and you had all this free money flowing around for all these retail guys. They were just loading the boat, dude. I was doing it. That's how I know it's it was happening. 
But you can't yeah. do that anymore. You yeah. can't do that anymore. I would, dude, I was buying like on credit cards, I'd buy like $3,000 worth of crypto. I literally wake up the next day, it's 12 grand. Yeah, yeah. And then you just, you know, I'm mean, just it's like, hard holy to crap, double dude. Down on that trade, right? Because it's it, you either double down on it or you. Else. You can just take your money out real quick and then go double down on something else. And then all of a sudden, you know, people are worth hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And it, you know, that just cannot be sustained because there's no real underlying fundamentals, right? And the fundamentals always catch up. Uh, yeah. Up. Okay, so we're kind of, kind of off track, but that's why I'm kind of uh, talking no, about No, but uh, this, is, this is relevant because, I mean, now what we have to do is, okay, like we're clearly bearish overall. We're clearly bullish oh, for the next 100%. little while. 100% um, bear right now. Like I'm 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 preparing myself. I'm being super mega patient. Like I think the the like a mega crash is around the corner. It's just not like it's not like tomorrow. You know, it's not like it's going to be Friday. Um, no, I I I agree. I agree and it's it's just seeing this happen off of CPI makes me think that it's going to be that much worse. Think about right. this too. These kind of things I notice is like okay, Apple went crazy on earnings, right? How much was it up? It was like 8% or something. Uh and I, I tweeted out, I was like, wow, that was really bearish. Yeah. That it was up 8% on, in one day. And me personally, I, that's what I thought. And then, you know, it, what did it go to like 157? And then like literally a week and a half later, it's trading 135s. Yep. And that's what you're going to see on a grander scale. It's just going to be like, man, I am so bullish because we just ran like 25% in like a month and a half or whatever it ends up being here if it, if it does start going up. And, uh, and people are going to be so complacent. They're going to be so bullish. They're going to think everything's behind them. And then we're going to get hit with something, dude. I don't know what it is. I mean, there's always something. So, well, I mean, I mean, I, so, okay, let's, let's, let's move from this into actual narratives because I have some ideas on that front. Um, okay. And, and I mean, most of these ideas have to do actually with CPI because I was looking at it and it seemed like one of the biggest uh, components of CPI that actually went uh, down was um, like clothing, garments, that sort of stuff, textiles. Um, and so again, these are things that don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily have, first of all, it's, it's a pretty small percentage, um, but it's just a lot of things, a lot of components stayed the same. Um, a very significant component, which is rents and like housing, let's not even get started on how they calculate that, that but um, it didn't move down at all. And then we had some of these guys come, up, come in under expectation and like these are pretty volatile, right? Like um and so for from the perspective of the federal reserve they're going to be looking at the cpi and they're going to be like okay great we relieved some tension in the system because the cpi didn't come in bad what does that mean okay we can keep tightening more um or we can at least say you know they're going to stay at five percent they're going to get there and they're going to hang out there for a little while and um I, I didn't get a chance to look at the fed funds futures yet i'll try and pull them up right now um, to see how they're how the yeah pull, pull those up I like I like this idea of five percent being kind of like the going uh, rate uh, I think it just logically makes sense uh, to hold it there for a while um, they've gone up pretty fast you know they went down pretty fast in 2020 and so you know kind of correcting for that uh, makes sense um, and I don't think we've seen it in equities I kind of I, I, and I think that's what they're thinking is they haven't quite seen the effect of it yet. Yeah, so so we're we're a little bit lower. I remember I remember that this like April, I'm pretty sure it was around ninety four point nine or something like that. So it came off a little bit. So it looks like we're expecting you know to get up to four point eight percent for people who don't know how to read these. Basically, you just take a hundred, subtract it, right. and that that gives you that effective uh, you know overnight rate for the the average overnight rate for that month. Um, so no substantial change in Fed funds futures, which seems accurate to me. Um, you know, if you really want to understand what's going on uh, and, and whether something has changed substantially, it probably makes more sense to be looking at the bonds, to be honest, rather than equities right now, because equities are being a little nuts. Um, but yeah, so this isn't going to change. And then what basically I think what happens is, you know, maybe we'll get another CPI that's a little weak. At some point, we'll get another CPI that's a little hot, right? Because there's just going to be bouncing up back and forth. And then we're going to get those Fed meetings and the Fed meetings, they're not going to change their discourse, right? And then everybody's going to be hella surprised that they're not changing the way that they're talking about this. And then that's what's going to bring us back down. That um, brings up such a good point uh, because um, the narratives that drive that drive the flows um, into the into these brick wall events is kind of what I always think about. It's like you got this narrative that starts getting built up and 
uh, you can follow it on FinTwit or StockTwits or, or what in your own chats. And you see these people and, and everybody is so sure of themselves of a certain thing to happen. Like everybody was so sure of the, of the red wave. Yeah. And what happened? There was no red wave. It was barely a ripple and it ended up, the Democrats ended up keeping the Senate. And so it was like, the ne never ever, this is something that's taken me really a long time to learn psychologically, is never trust the narrative, ever. The narrative will always lie to you, whatever the narrative is, because they have to push it out there like that. And what happened before FOMC? You had JPM come out and they were saying a possible 10% one day rally limit up if the if the Fed dropped it to 50 basis points. Well, okay, yeah, I guess that's a thing. If it's possible, right? <laughs> it's possible that could happen. But what does that do to everybody? It gets them all frothy and like foaming at the mouth for a 10% rally. I think I think that stuff is so funny because when I see 10% rally, um, I was looking at that and I was like, I mean, yeah, maybe, but where's that money going to come from to push us up all the way there? It was going right? to be a short. It was going to be a short cover. A short yeah. cover as people buy. But we got we got a massive short cover off CPI. We got 5.3 something percent. Like, but no, so my point was this is like that was before FOMC that that little, you know, thing got leaked out. And then they came in, and then what did they say right before CPI? They said possible 8% down day. If we get 8.3% on CPI. So, okay, they got everyone super bearish, and that was when FTX was crashing. So, the narrative going into the CPI for most people was bearish. Mm hmm. For, for your average person and and they thought it was going to come in hot and they thought we were going to crash and and yeah. what do we get the two one of the two best days we've had in a very very long time same and the opposite happened with fmc so that's why i say you can never trust the narrative it's extremely hard to because you got the big banks they'll come out and they'll push something out there and they always have an agenda for what they're saying and they're yeah, not and saying it to help you they're not saying it to help you the next one that they're saying right now is that for spx 4050 is going to cause a massive squeeze. Yeah, no, that's 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 ridiculous. Because um, the CTA momentum trigger, something like that. You know, I don't know. Is that true? I don't know. But when I see something like that, I go, dude, I'm watching out, dude, because the tails are super cheap right now, and it's not like they don't know that. You know, you don't think JPM doesn't know that the, the skew is in the zero percentile right now. And so get everyone looking at 4050 to take us to 4300, and then they're gonna they're gonna drop the hammer. Yeah. And I think that's um, the next that's the next dip to buy is going to be something like, yeah, everybody's looking to 4200 right now. Everybody is looking to 4200 right now. And I think they I think they're going to pop us up there, try to get everyone caught and they're going to drop you. They're going to drop yeah. you back to 3800. Well, cuz there's I mean I mean at that level you're going to create and and okay, so we're talking about it from sort of a sociological perspective, but it isn't just sociological, it's mechanical, right? They're going to create forced buying above a certain level. And that, I mean, that's what they're saying when they're pointing to those CTA, right. yep. those CTAs, right? There's all these sorts of- 108 um, billion forced buying coming if we hit 4056 SPX. Yeah, and that, that's just because, you know, if you're a fund manager or something like that, you, first of all, you have to use, go with what's working, but you also have to maintain certain allocations. And like, let's say that you have a, if you have a certain, um, like if you're not invested, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, like, uh, these things start moving. First of all, your clients are going to start to ask you, right? And you're going to have a little bit of pressure. But then on top of that, sometimes, um, you know, there are trend following type strategies. I don't want to say trend following exactly because that's a very specific sort of sector of the investment um, space. And there aren't a lot of pure trend followers out there. Um, I'm sure that like you've, you've gotten some exposure to that too by way of those Chem podcasts, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I listen to every single one. And so I listen to all those trend following guys um, and I find them really fascinating. I like the idea of the trend following. Um, it's sort of a boomer strategy to me. You know, if you have a ton of money and you just want to try and allocate it the best you can and keep it invested and stuff. Um, yeah. I, think, I think our audience and myself included is not in that camp just quite yet where, you know, we're in the building the accounts phase. Um, so where you can just buy, you know, a million, $2 million worth of a uh, dividend stock and just live off of it or whatever. Um, you know, that's where they're at. Those trend following guys, that's where they're at. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's why they're so chill all the time. Yeah. But, I mean, they're, they're they're other... little, you know, my <laughs> barometer says we're kind of bearish. It's like, they're not talking about tomorrow. They don't oh. give a crap. 
you know, and I'm talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about greater to 3,800 in the next couple of days and, yep. and then melt up the rest of the year. So we're a very, very much short term. So when we're talking about first quarter, you know, that's long term for me talking about first quarter 2020. No, no, and I think, look, I think actually in this case, you're right to be thinking on that type of a time scale because there's so much uncertainty, right? Um, yep. And okay, let's let's move on a little bit. I went on a little bit of a trend following tangent there. Um, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, keep I, going. I wanted to pull up this this DXY chart here. Um, there were there was just like a couple of people that were asking about about some macro stuff and um, to break things down for everybody for like this might be clear but it might not. Um, restrictive Federal Reserve policy, monetary tightening leads to a stronger currency. Uh, currencies are a global phenomenon. So currencies are priced relatively, right? Everybody who's done Forex knows that, right? It's always dollar or euro or euro dollar or whatever. Um, and so what actually matters is, are we tightening faster than everybody else around the world? Um, and if we are, then the dollar is really strong. And when you see this really strong uptrend in the dollar, that means that um, are the expectations for Federal Reserve tightening, those Fed fund futures that we were talking about, were really intense, um, really high, relative to how quickly the Eurozone was tightening, relative to how quickly um, other economies in the world were tightening. I mean, Japan was easing, for God's sake. Uh, China's thinking about um, stimulus packages now, especially as they're going to come out from this uh, zero COVID policy, which which I think is a strategic, it's, it's being weaponized in a very specific way. But um, when you see a move like this in the dollar, right, and I mean, to me, this is still just a mean reversion um, in some in some sense. I mean, it did definitely break through this trend line, but there's nothing saying that we can't come back to this hundred level and then start to work our way up again. So it's it's premature, I think, to call a top in the dollar. That being said, um, this move means that the international markets, it means that people trading gold out there, people trading currencies, they took this CPI to be indicative of a change in Federal Reserve policy in the same way as the equity markets did. That's interesting. Yep. That's I've never really thought of it as uh, you know the dollar strength coming from tightening expectations. That makes a lot of sense though. Uh, but if you look at it from that perspective, and if you look at it from that perspective, did we get a little overbought because of that? Did it go a little? Did it get a little hot uh, because they were expecting way more tightening than they should have? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, this is the other thing, right? We're talking about, okay, how, you know, our vol is going gonna, is gonna to give us some up, upwards pressure, like our vol returning to mean is going to give us some upwards pressure in, um, in the markets by way of how it, you know, ends up modifying uh, I vol and, and all these things, right? And then another thing is, hey, look, if the dollar comes down, and this, anybody can figure this out, um, if the dollar comes down, then that means that your equities are worth more in dollar terms. Uh, so that also gives a tailwind to equity markets, right? Yep. Um, so, so this is actually going to be really important to watch, and and I think that um, at some point this thing is going to see reason, right? So when we see, you can even think about it really, again, kind of mechanically. It's it's not it's not a perfect analogy, but like think about this as think about the dollar as a commodity, right? And like there's supply and demand for the dollar, and people all of a sudden they want dollars to buy equities, so um, they're taking dollars out. Uh, of the dollar, and then they're pushing them into equities, and then so the dollar comes down. Yeah, or um, bonds. They're buying bonds too. Or yes, yeah, they're buying oh, bonds too. I got another chart too, so that brings that. Keep going, but I got another chart to show everybody too. That's yeah, I mean, I was just gonna, I was just gonna bring out, uh, you know, gold futures as well, just so that you know people can see what the, what happened in gold because this was insane, right? Like it's, it was at this, um, and it's going right back up to this eighteen hundred level, which has been. So important for gold for so long. Okay, perfect. Let me pull up this other chart. Um, and I find this super. And this is another reason why I don't know. I'm I'm not, you know, I'm not I'm not the best macro expert. But when I look at a, a, a yield curve inversion where like 60% of the structure is inverted to the 30 year, because um, you can see the three month, three year, 20 year, two year, six month, one year, all are yielding more than the 30 year, and that just doesn't seem right. Um, you got the two month yielding almost as much as the 10 year, pretty much. I mean, 383 versus 385. And so the two month is almost in, and it did invert for a little bit. The two month is inverting the 10 year. I remember when people freak out, the two year inverted the 10 year. Yeah. 
And so, and you almost, you got the one month coming up too. It's not too far away, dude. And it's just like, you know, this rate structure here is, you know, it's not instant. Okay. It, apparently it's not instant, but it is definitely a, um, something to be wary of. I would say like something is broken. Well, this, this only makes sense if inflation expectations are high. And so this is where we start to move away from, okay, we know what the equity markets are telling us. Um, we have a little bit of an idea of what the you know global sort of more macro marketplace is telling us. But then let's look at the bond marketplace, you know, the locus of truth. We've talked about the world of appearances. Let's talk about the, the world of truth, um, which is the bond market. And this in, these inversions here, this tells you that inflation expectations are still high. Uh, the reason that I say that is because um, when you're going to, if you, right, when you do, um, how do you call this, whatever, like discounted cash flow analysis or whatever, right, you're going to, and most people aren't used to doing this because we've had such low inflation for so, for so long, but you have to, in order to, you have, in, you have to add the inflation rate to the uh, discounting rate. Right. Um, which is why you get this weird phenomenon where it's like, well, why is a 20 year the same as a, as a two year here? It's because that 20 year is going to be discounted by whatever, four or 5% annualized inflation over 20 years, which is a huge down, downwards pressure on the value of that bond. In other words, the more value, especially if we're talking about bonds in which, um, like treasury bonds, which, you know, maybe this has a coupon. I, I don't know exactly how the 20 year is structured, but the, the more value of that bond you have on the, um, what you call, I guess, the, what you, the, the back end, right? Um, the more that, uh, that face value is is put under pressure by those discounting rates plus the inflation rate. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it makes sense to me, but um, and it, it, it's kind of it's you know you got to kind of like know you know traded a bond or something to really understand the dynamic there. But um, yeah, it makes sense to me. I, I get it. So that's why I say when I look at this, I'm going, you know, who who in their right mind. <laughs> Who in the right mind is so scared that they're buying the two month, essentially, or, or jacking up the rate on the two month over the ten year, right? So like they're so scared that they don't want to put their money in the ten year, and that's why the rate yeah. is, is going up on the two month. You know, the rate rises and the more demand there is. So uh, you're you're seeing demand on the front end for all of these because people are so nervous. And that's what it tells me because yeah. people are scared. People don't want to tie their money up for 30 years or the people don't I, want to tie I, their up for 20 years. They don't want to tie it up for 20 years, 10 years. And no, I, I, I totally agree. And I mean, there's a lot more selling that that's going to be happening in the bonds because of the fed. Right. And um, yeah, the dollar isn't that low. I mean, it's still, you know, a hundred, even if it goes down to a hundred, like that's still pretty, that's still pretty high for the day. And that's another thing too. I think what you saw on, the last couple of days with this dollar and the VIX. I mean, you have that you have that structural situation we talked about with the VIX. That's why we talk about it first because, you know, you already have so many natural flows that occur because of the the short vol trade and and you know people's puts dying essentially, and then you've got the dollar as well. So when it, you saw the dollar down two percent, you saw the VIX down like four percent. You know, there's just no way there that the market's going to go down with that situation because the Dixie is almost like a VIX unto itself, and if you, you know, it's almost a volatility indicator. It, it was acting that way for the longest time. I think now we're going to start to see some decoupling happen there um, just because we had this massive rally. But, but yeah, I agree. So, uh, so you got, you got, you got bearish case all over the place, but so I'm talking bearish overall, but I'm saying like in the next couple of months, you got bullish case. In my opinion, you got a bullish thesis, and and you could basically lay a case out there that we could we could definitely rally into 420, maybe 440, on a on a blowout. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be that would be stellar for me, given that um, I'm thinking that there's going to be some kind of major uh, volatility event coming sometime in the first quarter of 2023. As far out as I'm looking, though, I mean, if you're listening to this and you think you think in five years, you know, you probably shouldn't be listening because <laughs> I'm not talking five years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only talking I'm only talking the first quarter because I'm sitting here going, look, I'm trying to time the market like every day. So, uh, you know, that's why that's why we're I, I kind of keep the whole macro theme, you know, and I've talked about this before. You know, I've got like I've got like a yearly plan, a quarterly plan, but 
it's like I try to keep the macro theme in my head because when you see stuff happen, then it, you can basically put it in a category of your macro theme. Yeah, yeah, pieces. exactly. And you I mean, go, oh, whenever, man, that's, that's like just a symptom of, you know, this happening, you know, and, and, and you can connect the dots. When, when I'm investing and I use options for my investing, um, I write out sort of like a prospectus document in which I'm, I make clear not only what did I want my sort of fund to do, but I, I make it clear what I think my projections are for the um, – and, and what I want to be buying when, approximately, right? Like, a lot of wiggle room. And to be honest, macro-wise, have not changed anything since I wrote it in, in the one for the more rec most recent one in August. And, um, and what, what was, your, what was your, your sort of your thesis from August? My thesis was, I'm not buying any equities until we actually get a pivot in the bonds, until we really, really get a pivot from the Fed. Um, and... Um, well, actually, actually, I did make one modification because I originally thought that come midterms, we were going to start to see that shift, that transition. Um, and now once the Fed funds futures changed again, it moved my projections out to February of next year. Um, but strategically, it didn't change anything because it was just like the only thing I want to be owning right now is gold and I want to be selling puts every time we have a crazy move down. And I'm just going to do that until it's time to own equities. And then I'm going to get in for prices that I like. Um, okay. So... Um, yeah, that hasn't, I mean, think crazy things have happened, but if you, if you think about this in sort of a longer term thing and you thought about, you know, what has the Fed been telling us all along, surprisingly, you know, we get all, I feel like we get so wrapped up in what's happening day to day because, you know, that's how I love to trade as well. Um, but if you just listen to the Fed and you listen to the bonds, nothing new has happened for a long time. Um, yeah, yeah, no. And, and it's like one of those things where it's like people say, don't fight the Fed. And do they really ever listen to themselves when the, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, do you really, I mean, you're still buying puts when the market is in QE4 and you're still out here buying puts, you know, and then you say, don't fight the Fed. And then the Fed is basically every single time Powell has come out and said, we're doing everything we can to bring inflation down. We've got all the tools and we're not stopping. We're basically going to crush and, and they're still buying calls now. It, it yeah. just bog it boggles my mind, and but you got to go with it though because if the flows are saying higher, you you can't fight it, especially if you're a short term trader. Uh, you have to go with you have to go with what's the seasonality. You have to go with the flows, the volatility, because you know fighting that in the short term is worse than fighting the Fed in the long term. I think. I I, I totally agree, and you know that's a that's a lesson that I think I I learned the hard way, definitely. Um, and that's that's something that, again you gotta kind of that, that's the thing that sucks about being a trader a short term trader anyways is because you gotta wear so many hats and you know you look at something and be like man I really want to buy this for the long term and it's like but kind of like you like I'm not buying equities until this or that happens but it's like you want to buy equities you know I want to own stock but I, I just yeah I yeah I, I also feel I feel that when I just saw that you know. Um, I was selling Nvidia puts at like 105, and uh, let me pull up that chart. Um, and after this, can we move on? We can do the GEX and then just like look forward to the next couple of weeks and then yep. and wrap up with that. Okay. Yep. Um, so I was I was selling Nvidia puts uh, at around 105, 100 because I wanted to own it down here, and now all of a sudden it's rallied it's back up to 156, and I'm like, oh man, why couldn't I have just bought that stock instead of selling those puts? And like I cashed out on them, I made I made money on them, right? Um, but I didn't make the money that I would have made off this massive rally that just happened. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, you're you're totally right. I didn't see this move in Nvidia coming either, man. I was I'm a super bear on Nvidia, and uh, I, I did not know it was going to rip to 160 uh, in a matter of a matter of weeks. But um, yeah, you, you're right, and that's what this is what the cycle is, though. Okay, this is yeah. what happens with people is they're constantly trying to catch the the ultimate generational bottom. <laughs> And it's like, you know, that's never going to happen. You know, you're not going to bottom tick a, a 2008 crash, okay? And so <laughs> <laughs> it's like you might as well, you know, and this is something I see with people is you might as well pick a strategy. You're going to be a short-term trader. You're going to be a long-term, you know, you know, buy the dip, trend follower. Uh, you really do. Or you're going to be a volatility guy. You really do have to pick something and just master it and be good at that and forget about the rest. And, and don't try to wear too many hats. And like we were talking about before we even got on, you're trading futures, and it's hard to trade futures intraday and then also trade options intraday. 
because a lot of times your your positions will go against each other. And psychologically, it's already hard enough to trade one one direction or, or one bias. But to have your biases fighting and being in contradiction, uh, that makes it way worse. Like it amplifies it way, like way much, way, way more. And uh, so that's the same thing as, as trading too many different strategies too, especially if you're a long-term, mid-term and short-term. If you're trying to manage all of that, like I made the mistake to doing that is trying to trade long-term and trade short-term. That is tough, man, because... Yeah, well, because you're constantly looking at charts that, um, you know, if you were to think about... It's almost like you're looking at the, uh, I don't know, you're standing in front of the candy shop as you're supposed to be eating your veggies or some, something. I, I don't have a great analogy. No, no, no. I, I know what you're trying to say. It, yeah. And, well, it's like if you're a long-term bull here on NVIDIA, it's like, well, like I really would rather just take profits here. You know, yeah. like it literally just ran from 100 to 156 or 160 in like four weeks. It's like that right there is already an incredible year. Like say you, you know, say you just did that four week span. I mean, you're already up 50%, 60% or whatever. And it's like that already is your year. Yeah. Are you really trying to hold this until it's a thousand dollars a share? Well then you, and might, I, uh, you might be seeing 50 again. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and meanwhile, I like walked away with, you know, um, with like a small, small, small fraction of that. And I just moved on to the next thing. And yeah, um, that's, that, that's why do. that's that's why it's really important, I think, to have a system. Because uh, if you have a system, and I only, you know, I'll only open up my, uh, you know, my portfolio page uh, in the two, like I'll be selling my options, um, you know, uh, around forty five days out or something like that, and then I'll, and I'll pull up the um, pull it up when when we're like a week out from expiring, and then I'll try and manage them, right? And I don't worry about them until then, right? Yep. Because it's what you're saying. It's like. If I don't yeah. have a system, if I don't let the system take care of stuff for me, and I'm trying to constantly take care of it myself, I'm gonna end up spread thin between too many things. Yeah. Um, so I'm not gonna worry about you know having missed this 50% uh, retracement on the video or whatever because I made my cash and I moved on. And I don't, yeah, you I don't did your play, right? You did your play. You weren't playing for the four week, you know, 60%. You were you were playing for like, look, I want to own own it at 100, and if it goes to 100, fine, I'll buy it there. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, they, of course, in this situation, it didn't, it didn't happen, but it's like the next time it, it rolls around there, do it again, you know, and, and there you go. Then you got your shares or, or they pay you again in, in your premiums. So it's like, you know, stick to your, stick to your strategy, stick to your guns. Don't, don't go too fast. The fastest way to make it is to go slow. That's the one thing I've, I've learned uh, over time. All right. So let's, let's talk about uh, the future. Um, what okay. do we think is going to happen this week? I, I personally think this week is going to be pretty volatile. Uh, if you look at the calendar, I would highly recommend to look at the economic calendar coming up here. And I'll, I'll pull this up for everybody. I'll, I'll send it to you. Uh, okay, great. Just so that uh, you know people can be aware. Because I think if you're going to plan out your week, your trading week, um, it's going to be extremely important here. I'm going to send you the link to it. That way you can kind of scroll. Uh, it's extremely important to know which um, – which events are gonna are gonna be your market movers and why? And so this is why I want to go over this real quick because uh, I would like your opinion on these events coming up. And uh, does that pull it up there? Yeah, good. So let's okay. go to uh, the 14th. Scroll down right. there a little bit. Uh, there you go. Nothing right, so on Monday. So you got you got one year inflation expectations and five year inflation expectations. Mm -hmm. Those are those are nothing. Uh, let me actually check because I have I have my own little calendar and it has a nice little weighting of. Uh, um, if the New York Fed is coming out with their inflation expectations, I would definitely be paying attention. I don't care what it, I don't know care what some you know chart is is weighting it. Like I care about that. I want to know what their expectations are. You know what what if they come in high? <laughs> All right. So I, I kind of think that um, I think I think the market wants to do its own calculations. So I actually don't think that those are going to be a big deal. Um, OK, well, that'll be but, at about uh, 11 a.m. on Monday. So if there was going to be anything happening on Monday tomorrow, uh, I would definitely be looking for a move around that time. If there were if this does matter or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, um, I'm going to assume it matters until it doesn't. And if it doesn't matter, then all, it'll tell me something. 
All right, I'll assume it doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll okay, all happens. right. <laughs> you assume it doesn't matter and go max long futures, okay, and, and see what happens. Uh, I'll, I'll sit there and wait. Um, and then the next day you got the PPI uh, on Tuesday. Now that, that guy does matter for me. At yeah. Least. yeah, so um, – well, yeah, so that's that's a big day. Uh, I would definitely be um, doing a little bit of extra planning. I will be doing a little extra planning on Monday, uh, watching watching the Gex, kind of seeing what people are thinking as far as this PPI comes, uh, come number comes out. Yeah, um, so I think I think I think that um I think these expectations probably came together before CPI came out, and so mm -hmm. like um, PPI typically moves with it more or less and is, is usually about what is it what would you say like 25 percent as important as cpi uh 30 percent maybe yeah and um, you know what's funny is like the uh the fed actually looks at the pce number so uh the cpi and the ppi actually aren't that big of a deal they're a big deal to to i don't know why they're a big deal to the rest of the market but the fed actually considers the pce to be a bigger to be their inflation barometer so yeah I always find that interesting that everybody's all the move comes around CPI when the Fed's not even really that weighted into the CPI as far as what their data they're data driven and their data weighting is on the PCE number. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong about this, but I think that um, the like the the Fed has a tendency to use lagging indicators that they feel are more reliable, and the market tends to prefer indicators that are as quick as possible, which is why we sometimes get these discrepancies. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, so a lot of these numbers, that's going to be a huge one on Tuesday. Uh, retail sales sometimes matters, sometimes doesn't. Um, I think it will matter uh, this time around. Uh, it, it, in my opinion, I guess if like retail sales came in strong, that would be negative. Yeah. And if it came in weak, you could see a, a rip. So that's going to be a thing. And the reason is because if it comes in strong, it means consumers still pretty strong and the Fed probably still has to do some more tightening. Um, that's just and, I, and I think we should also meet, mention that the other reason to expect a lot of volatility is all of a sudden all these Fed speakers are going to be coming out and uh, saying mm -hmm. uh, stupid stuff. As usual. Yeah, it's not the blackout um, anymore. So yeah, they're going to be uh, they're going to be out and they usually come in at the lows and the tops is what I've always noticed. It's always like the market the market will take because they know the Fed's talking, they'll they'll take it up to the highs and then they'll kind of wait around until the guy you know figures out what he's gonna say. And and then you usually get the reversal around where whatever he end up ends up saying. Because they always say whatever. I mean it, in my opinion it doesn't matter what they say because Jay Powell has already come out and said what he's going to say. Oh, it, 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 it doesn't matter. The market just wants some sort of like juice to just move. Exactly. Sometimes yeah. Sometimes. It just needs, it just, need, they're just kind of dinking the market around with their words and um, kind of controlling it that way. So, but yeah, you do, you do need to be aware of when they talk because uh, at least you could, at least you can be positioned around it or be hedged for it or whatever. Yeah. Um, but in the end. I, and then I didn't even notice this. I mean, thank God that we, uh, sometimes I don't I try not to think, I don't think about the markets over the weekends and then I forget. Uh, jobless claims on Thursday, that is big, actually. Um, it could, it could, that could move us a little bit. Not, not as much as, uh, you know. What are you uh, thinking on, what are you thinking on jobs? Do you think it's gonna, uh, if it's strong, what do you think the reaction is? Well, the Fed uses the, uh, the infamous, uh, Phillips curve, right? Meaning that the, the whole theory behind this monetary tightening is they, they get as many people fired as possible. They get people fired, people are less likely to buy stuff. That brings down inflation. Um, we all well, know that, 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 that brings that brings down wages, which then brings down inflation, right? Isn't that the idea? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I skipped a step. Um, it's okay. I was just all, making it, sure. <laughs> we we all know it doesn't really work that way, but they're still operating on this sort of antiquated paradigm. Um, so basically, jobless claims come in uh, hot, meaning like there's a lot of jobless claims, good for equities. Jobless claims come up come out low meaning we have still high employment numbers, uh, a strong economy, bad good. equities. Good, good. No, that's 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 great. So whenever you're uh, – if you have these ideas in your head going into these uh, events and uh, you're looking at something like a GEX chart or a SKU or options flow or whatever you end up looking at, uh, they're all just derivatives of the same thing in my opinion, uh, then you can basically know what the market's expectation is, right? So if, the, if we're expecting 225 on, on – 
jobs here and the market is looking really bearish, then jobs are probably going to come in. Jobless numbers are going to come in low. That's mm -hmm. what I would think. And then if they come in low, then then you know you're on the right side. Um, but if you if you understand sort of the implications of what these numbers mean going into it, uh, it will add a lot of color context to what you're looking at here, which is uh, a lot of positioning around the 400 or at least a lot of gamma around the 400. Um, there's actually not a lot of open interest there. If you look at the open interest charts. Uh, uh, I have that actually, because this is a, I have a net OI one. Yeah, so um, you can see the big net OI is down about 360. They uh, still haven't gotten out of those? Oh my God. I, I know, know and, and I think they're, <laughs> I, I, again, it's one of those things where I think people are just going, uh, you know, they're just like, it's too cheap not to own these. Yeah, now now the narrative has changed. Maybe maybe actually they yeah. did get out of those, and then somebody else bought them. Um, this yeah, happened. I I think I think people are just going like, look, because I'm looking at puts too. Like I bought some puts on on Friday, and I was just like, dude, these are dirt. Wait, who is selling me, you know, uh, an IWM whatever for this this price? I'm like, I just can't pass it up. I have to buy. I don't care, you know, if it goes to zero because it's so cheap. The risk is so small that it, it's not. It's worth it to to own it just in case. Um, so I think that's what's happening here is you're getting a lot of people that are just like, let me just own some puts just because, and but they're not really, they're not really positioning to the upside, but you still see a lot of that gamma to the upside. Um, yeah, so and I mean, lo and behold, at least on the OI, I'm looking at this, and it's like 420 is sort of the center of the belly of this yep. curve over here. And let me move back to the GEX now, um, and we're looking at it's a bit smaller, obviously, because it's so far out over here. Um, but yeah I so yeah that. this is going to be for monday so if we're just looking at monday uh monday wednesday friday um here then you know we're basically seeing you know the purplish color here is going to be you know mainly this week um and so you know seeing a move up into like 409 i mean that that makes sense to me if we if if we can move into that 409 number that fills that gap that's on the chart anyways and yeah. so I'm, I'm thinking that's what people are thinking is going to try. They're going to try and make happen. Uh, they're positioning for that. Um, that 400. Yeah. If it breaks, I mean, it's going to, it's, it, it could potentially lead to a little bit of a squeeze uh, into that number. How long it lasts though. You know, you never really know. I mean, it could squeeze there in, in a single day or a single session and then completely reverse. So. Well, also um, let's keep in mind that what is today? Today is the 13th. We're recording on a Sunday. Um, and we're going to have the VIXX on the 16th and then the monthly uh -huh. OPEX on the 18th, right? So yep. that means that that's another reason. Those events early in the week, they're probably going to be a little fine. We usually get a little bit of whipsaw around uh, VIXX. Um, but typically this week is sort of um, a little squeeze. Like it usually goes up with some whipsaw. Um, and then, you know, after the 18th, we should get a sort of a, a return. To so, the yeah. So keeping it, keeping an eye on that 18th uh, expiry, you can see it there. Um, there's an AM, <clears throat> there's usually an AM version and then a PM version. Um, I'm not sure if it breaks it out here. I'm not seeing. Uh, I'm, I'm on spy. That's why it's not. But I have oh, yeah. Go to, the, well. go to the GEX in. There you go. Here uh, we go. So that's going to be huge because 19% of the GEX uh, for OPEX expires on the AMs. And so that's usually around like 8.30 or 9 o'clock, I think, where all that is just gone. It's and where so, the futures are at 8.30, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's that's a big deal because, um, you know, all, all that GEX is going to be completely useless for you on Friday by the time the market opens, right? So uh, for the most part. And so uh, keeping that in your in, – in, in the back of your in the back of your mind, um, where that ends up being, like right now, it's positive, by like sixty eight percent. So and and fifteen percent of the OI is expiring on that day as well, and uh, most of its most of its inputs, you know, it's leaning put heavy. So you got mm -hmm. positive gamma leading put heavy. Uh, at the same time, I, you you probably see a ripper. If this was the case, if we were if it was tomorrow, I would I would be leaning towards. Um, going up personally but if i saw a lower put call ratio i probably think we were going to dive but uh even I, I, I totally i totally agree um there's so many there's like three or four different things um with gamma that high favoring the calls high put call ratio uh the skew even where it is here um mm -hmm. like 
that is favoring um, a move up into that AM expiry on Friday. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll still have to see how the week plays out. I think this is going to be pretty solid because I honestly think, I think the big move already happened. I don't think, you know, we're talking about a lot of chops. So, um, you know, I just chill week. I think, I hope. You think so, huh? I think it's going to be volatile. I think the reason I'd say it's going to be volatile is because I think people, I think people are, are uh, underestimating the tails still. And um, I think what you see is, you know, V shapes again, where you see the lows holding. I don't think you're going to see the, uh, the move like what Tesla had, where it just dives and just doesn't stop. I think you'll see those lows holding and then recoveries. I think you'll see a lot of that recovery type of action where you're going to see yeah. a dive, profit taking, and then the Vanna and Charm flows start hitting, and then we. Yeah, uh, I think I think it just depends on the time frame. I think like yeah, a lot of intraday volatility, but in terms of like if you're going to look at the this week on a daily looking forward, right? It just seems like we're going to be between 4,000 and 4,100, just like chopping around in here. Every time we have one of those events, we'll be like boop, 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 boop. Um, and then end of the week, you know, um, I, I honestly, I honestly hope that, um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm positioned both ways, to be honest. So I don't even know what I want. <laughs> I, I mean, right now for me, all I got is uh, a few puts that I bought that I thought were cheap and I saw some flow on and I was just like, yeah, I, you know, I hope, I hope they can at least take it back down to like 3,800. I know it's a long ways down, but if they could get it back to 3,800 before they started the the melt up, um, and you can see that's where the volatility trigger is. So you can think of the volatility trigger sort of like a zero gamma level. Um, if they really wanted to bring it back down to that level, and then and then we can start our our, our move back higher. That would be much mm -hmm. that would be much appreciated. That's sort of what I hope happens. Um, I I don't I don't know I, I not to be not to be annoying, but I don't know how it's gonna happen. You don't see how it could come down to 3,800. I mean, well, actually, now that I look at the NOI, I guess it could, right? It could come down here, and there's all the puts are out down here, so they're not at risk if it comes. That's down what I. That's what I mean, and and it's like you're not the market's not paying anybody out if it comes to 3,800. It's giving people another opportunity to get in long. So, uh, you know, it makes a lot more sense than and then having this, um, you know, no dip rally, that's just nonstop that nobody can get in. You know, I think yeah, it, maybe there's... if if we have one of these events that comes out a little negative, I could see that happening. The issue that we have here, though, is like if you look at the VIX gex, hey, like all these puts down here, these are actually pushing the market down in a way. Uh, sorry, pushing the mark, pushing volatility down. Right? I agree. I agree. It is it is suppressing the volatility. Uh, yeah, I agree. So with you're that. Kind That's of, all you're gone kind of on swimming Wednesday. Swimming against the current. You're swimming against the current there, but. Hey, look, we're at the at the lower end of this range. Could definitely see a VIX move back up to 24. That would be totally fine. Right at this put wall. Um, don't gex the VIX, but still. Um, do <laughs> no, you know what? I don't care what anybody says. Gexing the VIX is perfectly fine with me, dude. Because I swear this thing it works like a charm. Uh, <laughs> knowing where the the gamma is on the VIX and then knowing where the gamma is in the uh, SPX, um, I, I think it, I think it's uh, it's a beautiful synergy. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that later sometime, but why I think that. But I think it. I think you definitely can. And you see it work all the time. You'll see this vol trigger get traded again. You know, you'll see the put wall. Get yeah. Traded. And it's like there's there's no doubt in my mind that it works. But um, I can't explain it like somebody else. You know, that understand. Like maybe even you, you could probably explain it way better than me. But uh, definitely, I, I I am an advocate of of Gex and the VIX. Um, and so we're looking at it here, you know, you basically going to know that all the gamma on the VIX is going to expire on Wednesday. So all this put gamma is going to be gone. And so uh, we're basically assuming that these are flows uh, that are working against the VIX, suppressing it, and that's all going to be gone on Wednesday. So that's another thing to keep a, keep in mind is um, you're going to have a ton of positive GEX on the, on, the, on the SPX and SPY, and you're going to have a bunch of uh, negative GEX expiring. Uh, so that's going to be, you know, sort of a release of uh, of the dam, so to speak, um, allowing the market to sort of unpin again. Um, yeah. And and you'll see some volatility come back. Uh, it, you know, it'll be on some narrative. Okay, something will happen. You know, it'll be crypto related, or you know, you know, Bankman Fried will he'll like crash on a plane or something. Hopefully, it doesn't happen, but they'll say something like that, and it'll just be a narrative. And you know, 
who knows? I don't know what will happen, but it's like there's always something, and all it is is just going to be structural. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, uh, you know, probably a move. I don't say tomorrow, but I think a move back to 3,800 this week makes sense, uh, or, or at least down there, probably Wednesday. And then and then we'll have to take a look at what these GEX looks like, these, these GEX numbers look like for Friday, and uh, we can kind of make a judgment call on that. But my guess is they'll be pretty bearish, and you'll see some kind of crazy rally again uh, to take us positive for the week. Yeah. Um no objections here. I mean, you're you're usually better with the the, the, the crazier uh, things. Uh, <laughs> well, it's like uh, it's like it, it all just makes sense to me that you wouldn't start the melt up on OPEX week. Uh, you would start it like the Monday no, you're after. Right, you're right. It would it would be crazy. It would be crazy. It, it would start the Monday after. It, you know, they're gonna whipsaw everybody again, uh, especially after the two day rally. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to not, not bring it back down again, at least into some support levels and and sort of fill out. There's, uh, fill out those gaps below that are really just retracements, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, no, I think I think we got a real solid projection. Um, this is this is fun. I liked I liked going through like so much, um, yep. so much different stuff and just sort of improvising. <laughs>